it's really hard to go from reading 19th century Victorian English literature to something written in the 20th or the 21st century. I feel like a very disoriented time traveler. YouTube, it's Kim at K Becker's Books, and this is the second installment of my bookish week. So I'm going to show you the books I finished last week. Uh, don't be too impressed because I did not read all of these complete books last week. I finished them last week. Well, actually, I'm filming this on Saturday, so it's still the beginning. It's still this week. All right, now, two of them are going to be mini reviews. The first one I have to talk about is Maggie O'Farrell's Hamnet. Um, this is the first time in my reading life I've ever tabbed a book like this. And this was a buddy read with Gemma from Read a Book Gem, and I'll link her channel below. It was a wonderful buddy read experience. She is a great commentator and conversationalist, and we had a lot in common in the themes and the pieces of the, the narrative that we kind of both picked up on. And we, we had a conversation over Voxer, and often we picked up on the same passages that really struck us. So Gemma, thank you for the buddy read. It was awesome. I had a lot of fun. Um, Maggie O'Farrell's Hamnet. After I finished the book, I went on BookTube and I looked at a bunch of different reviews. Um, for the most part, they were glowing. So very quickly, Hamnet is a an, an imagining, not even a retelling, but an imagining of the family of William Shakespeare. The protagonist in the book is not even Hamnet, and it's definitely not William Shakespeare. It's Agnes, who is Shakespeare's wife. Now, Maggie O'Farrell, in the videos that I saw of her talking about Hamnet in the writing process, talked about how she did research into Shakespeare's family, and there was very little historical account about them, which is not unusual, especially about his children. He had three children. And one of his children died, and in the historical record, it basically only contained a date of birth and a date of death for um, his son. So Maggie O'Farrell was struck by that, and she she thought it was so unusual that, you know, the death of a child is a momentous occasion in somebody's, in a parent's life. Why wouldn't there be more information? But, you know, thinking about Elizabethan England, um the death of children was not unusual, unfortunately. So the, the novel Hamnet, uh, I, it's so hard for me to, to talk about this book because I was considering doing an individual video on just this book and I thought I was almost there and I was talking to Gemma about it. And then I realized there's absolutely nothing new I can say that another booktuber or another reviewer has already said on their videos. I would have nothing original to add. The only thing I can say is I absolutely loved this book. And this this is a book that broke the emotional seal and made me cry. It's been years since a book has done that and this did it. So we, we read about Agnes and we read about the backstory of Shakespeare's family. The novel opens with uh, the named, the titled character Hamnet running around the town looking for an adult to help his twin sister. His twin sister Judith is sick and feverish and he's terrified because in those days a fever could easily kill a child. And there's nobody at home except for the two of them. So he's running around town looking for his mother, his grandmother, uh, a doctor, another adult that can help because he simply has no idea what to do. It breaks after that account and goes back in time to talk about Agnes's family and her origins talks about her mother at length, talks about their family. She grows up with a brother, Bartholomew. It discusses Agnes's temperament and personality. Um, her mother dies having her brother, I believe, and her father remarries a woman named Joan. And Agnes is now, Agnes and Bartholomew are now the stepchildren. And in stereotypical fashion, they are not favored children. So there's a contentious relationship between Agnes and her stepmother, Joan. Agnes is described as a very physical, spiritual, intelligent, autonomous woman. And 
you could you could kind of stereotypically look at her as type of a a witch archetype or a a metaphor for a naturalist woman who was scorned only because she challenged the medical professionals and medical establishment in these days and so she was she was derided and scorned and um looked down on she was her dress was always dirty she, her hair was always messy she always had dirt under her fingernails she kept a kestrel she kept bees she picked flowers and plants and she gardened because she was an herbalist and so there's so much to discuss with agnes's story and it's interesting how the man she falls in love with and marries is, is shakespeare who throughout the entire novel remains unnamed the the very special thing about this book is the way O'Farrell writes. Her language is is poetic, even though O'Farrell is more of a novelist. But the language is so descriptive without wasting words. I don't know if that makes any sense. But she's not flowery. She describes, she goes from one sentence to another in her description, and you feel that you're living there. You feel that you are in the town of Stratford. You feel you, you can smell the smells and you can see the sights. Her sentences flow. And it's not that her writing is spare, but it's just masterful. And she goes from one paragraph to the next. Um, it's hard for me to, to think of the words to describe the book because it's so special. And she captures the emotions and the the tension and the conflict, there's there's tension constantly through the novel. Some of it is, is exciting tension, some of it is happiness, some of it is expectation, much of it is horror and sadness and shock. She captures all of that in the language. Gemma and I consistently kept saying, I don't know how she's doing this. We don't know how she's doing this so well. And the book, even though it's the story of Shakespeare's family, he, did, like I said, he remains unnamed. And I thought that she did that because the story wasn't about him. And had she put the name of William, Sh William Shakespeare on the pages, the book would have been overrun with the thought that he's the main character and that the reader needed to pay attention when his name appeared to follow the events talking about him. And that's just not what the novel is about. Ultimately, it's a story of grief, how, the, how a mother deals with losing a child, how a, a married couple deal with the loss of, of a child and what that does to their marriage, how each of a, the parents grieve differently, how a sibling grieves, how the extended family grieves and what happens to the dynamics in the family after a child dies. Um, it, I wish I was considering doing a video review and adding spoilers because it would be so it would be so satisfying to me to talk about the actual details in the novel, but I'm not going to do that. The other thing that I thought was genius was the way she wrote about the journey of a flea. And if you've read the book, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't or intend on reading the book, pay attention when it gets to that portion. It's somewhere in the middle of the story. I was blown away by the novel, and yes, it made me cry, actual real tears. And in my humble booktube opinion, this is a masterpiece. So if you're intending on reading Hamnet, please do it sooner rather than later. I don't know if I said this already, but my, my reading week was absolutely incredible. It was one of the best I've had in a long time. And the other reason why is I finally finished Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. Here's another book that I tabbed all over the book. I want to read one that I tabbed very early on in the book. And here's the first, the first tab and the first page of highlighting. Now, I'm going to go backwards. Let me just briefly tell you what this book is about. Ralph Ellison wrote The Invisible Man, and this was published the first time in 1947. Um, in the last time in 1952. This is the story of an unnamed young black man who moves up from the South and ends up going north to Harlem, New York. And this is, you know, set somewhere in the 40s and 50s. Um, I, it, this is a very difficult book to read because 
of the themes and the commentary. However, it's important to read and it's it's a classic worth work of literature. And I, I can't say I enjoyed reading it because it's, it is very difficult to read in, in reading the events and the stories of this unnamed black man. There is, there are themes of racism, of class, of invisibility of black men. Uh, there's so much history that Ellison puts on the page and there's so much to analyze. And that's why there's so many tabs and highlights. And I wanted to read this one. Um, I'm gonna try to read both of these quickly and bear with me. Uh, the backstory is our character is driving around, he's acting as a chauffeur to a an elderly white um, supporter of the college that this young man is attending. And his job is to drive the man around, to be, um, to blend in, to be unobtrusive, to to be a chauffeur to, you know, guide the man wherever he wants to go to very, in a very friendly and patient way, answer his questions. And basically just to bring him from one place to the next. In the story, he's driving around this elderly man and they come upon the farm of a former slave family. And I don't really want to give the details, but the white man is, is shocked and surprised at what he finds. And he ends up getting out of the car and talking to the, the black um, home owner and the father in the family. And it's a very shocking event. And he gets back in the car and they continue to drive around. After that conversation with that black man, the, the elderly white supporter of the college is kind of taken aback and he's kind of in shock and he, he feels ill and he ends up kind of passing out. So this young black driver decides he needs to bring him somewhere for help. And he ends up at a, a bar and a brothel that is meant purely for black people. And so he walks in with this elderly white man passed out who needs medical attention. And this, this bar is patronized by former World War I veterans. And some of them are suffering from PTSD or what was called shell shock. They, they have psychological issues. They're, um, they're all kind of hanging out together, commiserating of their war experiences, and they are called the veterans. And this one veteran claims he was a doctor, and so he's trying to offer help to this poor elderly white man who's passed out. The young black man who was assigned to be his chauffeur is the observer. And this, this man who is faking having once been a doctor is talking and he says, Mr. Norton is the elderly rich white man. You see, he said, turning to Mr. Norton, he has eyes and ears and a good distended African nose, but he fails to understand the simple facts of life. Understand, understand, it's worse than that. He registers with his senses, but short, short circuits his brain. Nothing has meaning. He takes it in, but he doesn't digest it. Already he is, well, bless my soul, behold, a walking zombie. Already he's learned to repress not only his emotions, but his humanity. He's invisible, a walking personification of the negative, capital N, the most perfect achievement of your dream, sir, the mechanical man. That's one black man talking about another black man. And on the next page, a little child shall lead them, the vet said with a smile, but seriously, because you both fail to understand what is happening to you. You cannot see or hear or smell the truth of what you see. And you, looking for destiny, it's classic. And the boy, this automaton, he was made of the very mud of the region, and he sees far less than you. Poor stumblers, neither of you can see the other. To you, he is a mark on the scorecard of your achievement, a thing and not a man, a child or even less, a black amorphous thing. And you, for all your power, are not a man to him, but God, a force. Uh, there is so much to analyze and talk about in Invisible Man, the black man being invisible. Um, this young, naive, impressionable black man falling into situations that he can't either control or remove himself from. The maturity and the things that he learns along the way, as shocking and repulsive as they may be, and what he learns about his status in the world, his identity, his lack of identity, and the fact that as a black man in this time in, in society, 
he's looked over and he's used because of his color. He's used because he can uh, offer something to white people to their benefit and not his own. There's so much to talk about with race relations and the history of, of Harlem in the 40s and the 50s. Um, again, there's this is this is difficult. I started reading the book in February during Black History Month, and I I read almost up to a half of the book and and put it down because I couldn't read this along with other books at the same time. There was too much to concentrate on, and so I just finished it yesterday. Um, I did give it four stars because mostly because of the writing style. Um, it's it's very male centric, which is understandable. Uh, the female characters are, are not written in a positive light, very, very stereotypical. The book jumps and keeps jumping and it, it the main character is extremely naive and kind of ends up, he ends up in one situation after another after another where he has no agency or control over his own life and existence. No, he has no, no, he doesn't exercise his choice. So he just ends up being carried from one negative situation to another. By the end of the book, he does realize who he is in a way. He does realize he needs to define his identity himself. He can't continue to rely on external advice or forces to define his identity for him. And uh, there's, there, I keep saying this, but there's so much to talk about. The style throughout the book is very much um, commentary hidden in narrative and it's n it's not even really hidden there it's commentary buried and included in the narrative so at times it does get very preachy and very lectury however this is a perfect book to teach in an advanced placement literature class or a high school English class simply and and even though it was published so long ago it is relevant today. It's especially relevant today. Um, so read this, take notes, highlight and tab. Um, and this is a great piece of fiction to also learn from. The other book I finished actually just this morning is Sense and Sensibility f from Jane Austen for Jane Austen July. Uh, this is Jane Austen's first novel and Katie at Books and Things and Marissa are hosting Jane Austen July, and I thought I'm going to start from the beginning. I've read Pride and Prejudice many years ago, and I'm now on a, my own personal project, having been motivated by Jane Austen July, to continue to read Jane Austen's novels and to read through all of them in order, because I tend to be very methodical. So I read, Pride, um, sorry, Sense and Sensibility finally. The movie with Emma Thompson is one of my favorites. I've since watched the BBC miniseries twice and love it. It's much closer to the book. It is the story of Eleanor and Marianne Dashwood, um, two young sisters. Marianne, I think, is 16 as the book begins. Eleanor is probably a couple of years older than her. And it's set in Victorian England with the culture and social aspects of Victorian England. They come from a, a poor situation and they have to figure out what they're gonna do with their lives, how they're gonna survive. Um, in this day and time in Austin's Victorian England, you needed to marry well in order to be accepted in society. And uh, I absolutely love the book. I love the movie, I love the mini series, I love the story, I love the book. Um, five stars for me. And Brian at Bookish is also reading Sense and Sensibility, and I'm gonna link his video, his hodgepodge video from today below where he talks about it. And what I also want to do is I am gonna go on and read Pride and Prejudice again, but along with reading the actual classic novel, I wanted to read a retelling. And for Pride and Prejudice, I picked The Cookbook Collector from Allegra Good Goodman. Let me quickly read a little bit. The Cookbook Collector is hailed as a modern day Jane Austen and it says, Emily and Jessamine Bach are opposites in every way. 28-year-old Emily is the CEO of Veritech. 23-year-old Jess is an environmental activist and graduate student in philosophy. Pragmatic Emily is making a fortune in Silicon Valley. Romantic Jess works at an antiquarian bookstore. Emily is rational and driven while Jess is dreamy and whimsical. Emily's boyfriend, Jonathan, is fantastically successful. 
Jess's boyfriends not so much, as her employer George points out in what he hopes is a completely disinterested way. So it matches up with Eleanor and Marianne, and the book was published in 2010, so I'm looking forward to reading a retelling of Sense and Sensibility. What I also found, based on a book that Katie on Books and Things highlighted a while ago, that I bought on my Kindle for $2.99, so go look for it if, it, if you want to read more about this, is Ele Elegant Etiquette in the 19th Century by Mallory James. Um, again, $2.99 on Kindle today, I bought that. But I wanted to read more about the history of the social and pragmatic aspects of Victorian England and under have more clarity behind why the characters had to do what they did in even reading into Pride and Prejudice with similar characters coming from similar backgrounds. I wanted to get more clarity on the social customs and the financial customs of Victorian England. Okay, very quickly, the books that I'm currently reading and the book that I will start reading shortly, I am reading Excellent Women by Barbara Pym as a buddy read with Ange from Ange with an E, and I will uh, link her channel below. This is my second Barbara Pym, and I absolutely love her stories. I love her writing. Again, I'm tabbing this one, so I, ha I know what I want to talk about with Ange. Uh, very quickly, it's the story of single Mildred, and I totally forget her last name, single Mildred, who is... Um, a former uh, preacher's daughter, both of her parents have passed away, and she's a little over 30. She describes herself as plain, unnoticeable. She is a church-going woman, and um, it basically talks about her life as an excellent woman, an unmarried, very young spinster. Um, but I, again, I want to read more about Barbara Pym herself because of the the noticeable um, themes in her books. And again, I read Quartet and Autumn, I think last year and absolutely loved that one. I'm still reading P.S. I Love You by <laughs> Cecilia Ahern. I'll get to this eventually. I, I enjoy it. It's a really fun read, but there's been so many other things to concentrate on. I'm going to eventually get to that. I am taking part in the These Truths Read Along by Jill Lepore, which is hosted by Karen Evans. I will put, uh, put all the links in the description box below. Um, I am really excited about this. This is a big giant history book and we're going to be reading this over the year. So I just started reading that one. And for July, I'm going to be starting very soon Jazz by Toni Morrison for the Tony, the year of Toni Morrison, which is hosted by Hannah from Hannah's Books. Get off my channel and go to hers because she's amazing <laughs> and she has the loveliest voice. So, um, the book for July is Jazz, and then I'm hoping we're going to go to Paradise by Toni Morrison for August, but going to be starting that one very soon. So this is my second My Bookish Week, and it's a little longer because of the amazing, spectacular we reading week I had last week, or earlier this week. Um, it's my daughter's 13th birthday tomorrow, and we're trying to get ready for that. I'm freaking out a little bit. I've already had one teenager. This is going to be my second so um, I got plenty of wine. I think that'll work. I might have to go to tequila by the end of the day. So thanks so much for sticking with me through this longer video. Thank you so much for watching. Subscribe if you haven't already. Send me a comment below. Tell me anything about any of the, if you've read Hamnet, what you think about Invisible Man. If you've read Jane Austen, send, write a comment below. Um, I love having conversations in the comments and uh, We'll see what happens. So again, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Take care.